Hotel Hotel. Uh, welcome in, welcome in, everybody. Uh, give me just a second. Let me get everything set up how I want it set up. And we're going to get right off into this one. Let me just make sure everything good. Okay, let me get everything set up. Okay. Okay. Uh, y'all see we got an early one today. We got an early one today. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Hey, make sure when you come in the building, you hit that like button. Make sure if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. It's really important that you subscribe. We're trying to build a channel. We're trying to get this information out there. And um, you guys know me. I'm trying to let the ancestors speak. Help me give the ancestors a voice. Uh, Ian Williams. Hey, good morning. Good morning to you as well. Hey, I'm working on that list. I, I, I recognize the name. I'm familiar with who you are. And I'm going to get that list to you. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Thanks for tapping in. Um. But um, today, I got a real, real, real good one for you guys. And as usual, this is going to be chucked full with a lot of information. So today, we're going to be talking about three tales of hoodoo conjure. We're going to be talking about tarot card use. We're going to be talking about potions. We're going to be talking about supernatural sight, the ability to, to see into someone else's life so that you can heal them and that you can figure out what's wrong and that you can make them whole. And as usual, all of this is going to be coming from the documentation of our ancestors themselves. We're going to be letting our ancestors speak and we're going to be allowing our ancestors to tell us their stories so we can get a firsthand account of exactly what they were doing. You don't want to, you don't want to miss this one, family. Give me just a second. Again, like I say, make sure y'all hit the like button when you come in the building. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Let me just get this screen share going so I can pull up this PowerPoint and uh, we can get right off into the information. I know why you guys are here. You guys are here for the information. Y'all are just like me. You like to hear it directly from the horse's mouth. Um, I tell people all the time, a lot of times when we're looking into our history and we're looking into our ancestral records, I do it too. So it is not a knock on anyone, but we tend to go so far into the ancient past, we overlook a significant part of our history. Um, yes, you know, um, our ancestors come directly for the, from the African continent, and it's good to look back into Africa and see what our ancient ancestors did, you know, see what they were doing 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. All of, the, all of that is fine, you know, looking in the ancient Egypt, looking in the ancient Mali, um, looking in the ancient Ghana, um, you know, looking into West Africa prior to colonialism and prior to the transatlantic slave trade, looking into Central Africa, you know, looking into the Congo, the history of the Congo. I, I have books on all of that, and I've uh, studied a lot of that extensively. But um, what, what I think we don't do enough, I think we don't focus on um some of our immediate ancestors who went through um the transatlantic slave trade and who experienced chattel slavery on these shores and um i think when we when when we do that we do a slight disservice to our history because there are so many individuals who experienced that and who experienced the time immediately after that the time period that we call um the reconstruction era and we call um jim crow the jim crow era um, what, what we do is we we miss the significant points of our story that brought us through one of our most trying times. And in all actuality, when you think about it, so many of our ancestors were taken from so many different places in West and Central Africa and brought to America on various slave plantations. And they were shipped from one state to another. They they they, they were shipped from South America to um to the Americas, um, North America, where we are currently residing at, where, where I'm currently residing at in the United States. And um, they we, we, we intermingled and we intermixed with the Native American population. Um, some of us, our ancestors were um, taken advantage of by the slave master. And so we have so much going on in our DNA and in our genetics that it is almost like the, we're, we're a new people, you know, a new people with, with ancient roots. OK, and something happened. 
um, um, during that time of our enslavement, when a uh, population of people who have various different backgrounds, when you look back a thousand years, 1500 years, something happened that gave them all our ancestors a shared experience, a shared experience that um, other individuals in the world don't have. And that shared experience was so impactful and the, the the end result of that did not result in our ancestors going back to their respective homelands and, and going back to how it was a thousand years ago. That um, it, it, it's almost as, as like um, we're somewhat of a new people, a new people with ancient roots. So um, in order to understand why we are how we are right now today, we have to understand what we've been through and we have to start highlighting um, the individuals that that were strong enough, brave enough, courageous enough, um, um, that had enough endurance, that had enough intestinal fortitude to deal with the horrors of chattel slavery and the transatlantic slave trade so that we could even have the ability to uh, be alive right now today, to have a story to tell. They, they weren't killed off. They weren't broken. They, they, they weren't exterminated. And um, so so. We need to look into that. And there has been a lot said about what our ancestors felt, what our ancestors believed, what our ancestors taught. But um, um, we haven't heard from them enough. So I like to go into the records that are um, known as slave narratives a lot. I call them uh, slave narratives and or oral history because in, in those we get to hear our ancestors speak for themselves. So today, as usual, we're going to be allowing the ancestors to speak on this, your most premier channel for highlighting the history of our ancestors on these shores. And so again, we're going to be talking about three tales of hoodoo conjure. We're going to be talking about tarot cards, potions, supernatural sight, and more. Um, this is one you don't want to miss. Okay. So uh, first and foremost, let's get this out the way. Um, we're going to be looking at the Georgia slave narratives. For anyone who want to do further research on this particular topic, this is coming out of the Georgia slave narratives. And the ancestor who gives us this information is an ancestor named Emmeline Hurd. So uh, ancestor Emmeline Hurd from the Georgia Slave Narratives. May your name live on forever and may your memory never die. And we appreciate you documenting this over the history so that we could look at it today. Now, getting right off into it, um, just to give you guys a little background and physical descriptions of ancestor Emmeline Hurd, we learn from the oral histories that Emmeline Hurd is a small dark brown skinned woman who appears to be about 67, but is probably older. Her mind seems to be active. However, as she responds quickly to questions and expresses herself intelligently. Now, um, we do know that uh, Emmeline Hurd is older than 67 years old because this, um, um, this particular slave narrative interview was done in 1937. And the ancestor tells us that she was born maybe four or five years prior to the Civil War. So um, real quick, if uh, the Civil War uh, began around, let's just say 1861, let's use that date. And the ancestor was born five years prior to that. We could say that the ancestor was born around 1856. Okay, so let's do... 1937, 19, give me just a second, 1937 minus 1856. So really and truly the ancestor was probably around like 81, 80 years old. Okay, that's probably around about how old she was uh, when this particular interview was taken. Now it says Henry County near McDonald, Georgia is Emily's birthplace. Judging from her earliest childhood memories and what she learned from her mother, her birth must have occurred four or five years before freedom, before the Civil War. Her parents, Lewis and Caroline Harper, had 11 children of whom she was the second oldest. 
Now, um, so we get a understanding of who we're talking about. We get a general description of her. She's small, dark brown skin. She's around 80 years old, but her mind, her mind is still sharp. And she's born somewhere in Georgia. Okay, she's born somewhere in Georgia, and um, she was still living in Georgia when these particular slave narratives or this oral history was uh, documented. So real quick, I'm going to give you guys just a, a small bit of information about the city that she's from, because it's going to be important as we move forward with these stories. It's going to lend credibility to, um, to her stories, because I always like to validate what the ancestors said. Because you will always have some people who who try to make it seem like um, these slave narratives, these oral histories, the information in them uh, uh, aren't they don't have historical value because they don't believe what our ancestors had to say. But I believe what I believe what they had to say, just like I would like an individual to believe what I have to say. So uh, we see just like the um, oral history said, McDonald is a city in Henry County, Georgia, United States. It is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. Now, I highlighted that for a reason. Moving forward, remember, it is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. It is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. We're going to come back to that a little later. Um, now, the history of this particular town, the town was named for Naval Officer Commodore Thomas McDonald and founded in 1823 around a traditional town town square design. So again, if the ancestor was born um, five or, four or five years prior to the Civil War, and she says this is the city that she was born in, um, she is absolutely correct. This city was actually founded in 1823 with, with, with um, it was a significant amount of time before before the Civil War. And I just like to point out small facts like that to to validate the truth behind the statements. She was born where she was said she was born when she said she was born there. And the last thing I want to point out before I move forward, because this is going to be important as we move forward as well. Um, the last highlighted portion, it says the town was relay was a relay station on the New York City to New Orleans stagecoach line and was connected by other stage lines with Fayetteville and Decatur and with Macon by way of Jackson. So remember the town, McDonald, Georgia is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. It was founded in 1823 and the town was a relay station on the New York City to New Orleans stagecoach line. Remember all of those key facts as we move forward. Now, um, the beginning of the um, this particular slave narrative or oral history, it says on December 5th and 4th, 1936, Miss Emmeline Hurd was interviewed at her home, 239 Kane Street. The writer had visited Miss Heard previously, and it was at her own request that another visit was made. This visit was supposed to be one to obtain information and stories on the practice of conjure. On two previous occasions, Miss Heard's stories had proved very interesting, and I knew as I sat there waiting for her to begin that she had something very good to tell me she began. Now, um, Miss Emmeline Hurd was interviewed on multiple occasions. Since she had so much information to give and the information was so interesting to the interviewer, they went back to her multiple times to get more and more stories from her. And I actually did another video on some of the um, the information that Miss Emmeline Hurd gave um, the other day. And that's uh, that's posted on my channel as well. But we see here that the interviewer actually came back to conduct this video to get information and stories on the practice of conjure. So in this video, we're going to be getting firsthand accounts on how um, 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 some of the conjuring was practiced right in, in, in the real world. I'm going to show you guys an actual hoodoo conjure potion. I'm going to show you the ingredients 
I'm going to show you the ingredients themselves so you can see what some of the ingredients were. I'm going to show you how those ingredients were used. And I'm even going to show you how a hoodoo conjure tea was created. A, a, a tea that was created for medicinal purposes to heal someone from um, being sick, from being negatively conjured. So um, we're actually not going to only see the, the, the talk about conjure we're going to see some of the ingredients that an actual practitioner one of our ancestors who was an actual practitioner actually used and how those ingredients were implemented and what they were used to treat and and how the ancestor came up with this so this is chock full of, of a lot of information and so just remember that this interview or these interviews were conducted december 5th and 4th 1936 OK, now the first story that we are going to be looking at, I jokingly titled, help me. There's a bug in my ear. Um, we're going to hear about ancestor Julian, who is suffering from spells that causes her to fight and kick. After going to the conjure man, she is told that she has bugs in her head and he works his craft to save her life. So the first tale of conjure that we're going to be looking into is help me. There's a bug in my ear. OK, now let's read what the ancestor has to say. Uh, let's get into this oral history. Ms. Emily Hurd says, child, the, this story was told to me by my father and I know he sure wouldn't lie. Every word of it is the truth. Fact. Everything I ever said, everything I ever told you was the truth. Now, my pa had a brother, old Uncle Martin, and his wife was named Julian. Aunt Julian used to have spells and fight and kick all the time. They had doctor after doctor, but no one, but none did any. I'm sorry. They had doctor after doctor, but none did any did her any good somebody told uncle martin to go to her old conjurer and let the doctors go because they weren't doing nothing for her anyway pause right there um you're going to notice a lot of times um our ancestors they 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 went to the conjure man and they went to the conjure doctor when um traditional medicine and traditional doctors could not do any any they couldn't do any good. They couldn't figure out what was wrong because the problem was apparently it was more than just a like a, a medical problem. You know, like even even in today's world, you know, you fall, you break a bone or you, you know, you get really sick. It only, it only makes sense. Right. To, you know, go to the doctor, go go to a professional and try to get some kind of help. Now, when those methods fail, um, one can begin to assume that the problem is something that these traditional medical doctors are not equipped to deal with, right? And um, whether individuals believe it or not, sometimes those problems are caused by what our ancestors called conjured individuals putting putting bad spells on them, bad spirits on them, individuals bringing trauma and and negativity and 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 pain and bad health, individuals putting that into their life. And so when the problem has a spiritual cause, right? It, it, it has a spiritual cause and it's not solely a, a natural uh, occurrence, then that spiritual um, attack can only be repelled by a spiritual attack. It, it has to be addressed both medicinally and spiritually. And our, our ancestors, they... Even in ancient days, our ancestors, science, medicine, religion and spirituality, they were always mixed. They, they were they were always joined at the hip. I don't care if you go back 5000 years to ancient Egypt, you go back 5000 years to ancient Egypt. The doctors not only treated the physical body, but while treating the physical body, they also treated the spiritual body as well. They fixed your physical health and your spiritual health. The, the 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 two things went side by side. It is only in certain cultures and in certain modern times when 
uh, uh, um, the 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 natural and the spiritual are are separated from one another. Oh, you either going to deal with this on a spiritual level or you're going to deal with this on a natural level. When really and truly the natural and the spiritual are really they're they're kind of like joined at the hip. Even with how you understand like the, the the human makeup, the human body, the human frame, you're you're a physical being, right? You're a physical being. You you have flesh, you have bones, you have organs, you you have um um cells, you have tissue, you have muscles, you have these these physical aspects of your existence, but you also have the, um, the soul or the spirit, you have your consciousness, you have a part of you that obviously does not reside. In the body, how you think is not a physical part of the body, because when you die, what happens when you die? Your body goes back into the dirt. They they bury you six feet deep. They put dirt on the body. But you, the real you, the spirit, you, the soul, you, your consciousness has has already left and gone on somewhere else. So there is a more multifaceted um, portion of our existence. Right. And so our ancestors, they understood that you could not only deal with the physical. You had to deal with the physical and you had to deal with the spiritual at one time. So a lot of times when our ancestors would go to the doctor and the doctor only tried to um, um, heal the physical and it wouldn't work, a light bulb would go off and they would be uh, referred to a conjurer because the conjurer would not only deal with the physical, they would also deal with the spiritual aspect of whatever the um, whatever the problem, whatever the problem was. And so we, we see that a lot. The conjure man and the conjure woman was a uh, intricate part of our society. Um, back during those days, I know a lot of times individuals will they 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 tend to say that oh it was you know it was Christianity and it was the Bible that carried us through. Now I don't want to attack anybody's religion or anybody's spirituality. That's not what I'm here to do. But I, I just want to say it was not only um, Christianity and the Bible that carried us through. It was a lot of our traditional practices that carried us through as well. They, they, we were intimately connected to that spiritual realm during our entire enslavement. Okay. And a lot of people were helped by the conjure man and the conjure woman and the hoodoo practitioners did a lot for us. And I don't want that history to be, uh, um, buried and I don't want that history to be undermined and overlooked. But I, anyway, the ancestor says somebody told Uncle Martin to go to an old conjurer and let the doctors go because they weren't doing nothing for her anyway. Sure enough, he got one to come see her and give her some medicine. This old man said she had bugs in her head. And after giving her the medicine, he started rubbing her head. While he rubbed her head, he said there's a bug in her head. It looks just like a big black roach. Now, an interesting side note, I noticed from reading a lot of these stories about conjure, um, they will all, they will, a lot of times they will make references to the problem being caused by some type of creature in the body. And I'm, I'm thinking that um this 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 creature, this 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 bug is um some type of a uh, 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 analogy that is talking about the bad conjure right i saw one story where an individual said that he had a snake not not in his arm the snake was in his in his stop the snake was in his leg and it had moved up to his arm something like that but an individual had a snake in their body um this individual is saying that somebody has a bug in their head and we're going to hear more allusion to this as as we go forward so there there is something to um, being conjured, negatively conjured in such a way to where the, the conjurer puts something in an individual's body and that something causes them um, um, pain, ill health, and it can sometimes lead to uh, death. But anyway, um, she says, now he's coming out of her head through her ear. Whatever you do, don't let him get away because I want him. Whatever you do, catch him. He's going to run, but when he hits the pillow, grab him. I'm going to go take him and turn it back on the one who is trying to send you to the grave. 
Sure enough, that bug dropped out her ear and flew. She hollered and old Uncle Martin ran in the room, snatched the bed clothes off, but they never did find him. Aunt Julian never did get better and soon she died, RIP to the ancestor. The conjurer said if they had caught the bug, she would have lived. Now, I want you to notice something. When the Aunt Julian started to holler, Uncle Martin had to run into the room, indicating that the conjurer man had took Aunt Julian into a separate room. Um, she, the conjurer man had given her some type of medicine, and then he had begun to rub her head, saying that she had bugs in her head, and he was trying to get the bug to come out of her ear. Um, that's another thing that's kind of common with, um, with the practitioners of hoodoo and when they're, when they're trying to heal somebody, you, you, you will see certain rituals that are performed. And sometimes these rituals are performed by taking the individual into a designated spot, laying them down, um, either giving them medicine to take or applying medicine to their body somewhere and saying certain words, certain words of power um, that, you know, they call spells, but it's reciting certain words that are supposed to um, affect the spiritual nature of what's going on. I said this in another video, but um, go all, going all the way back to ancient Egypt, where a lot of these spiritual practices disseminated from and, and, and spread out throughout um, Africa and really the rest of the world, um, they called it Heka or words of power. It's been long known that your words have power. Words have power. What, what, what you say can affect your reality, right? What you say can affect your reality. So these conjurers, um, what they would do, they would often have certain things that they said in conjunction with the application of the medicine, which was supposed to um, heal the individual. And you see that when the bug came out, he told him when the bug comes out, you're ill, we need to catch it because he wanted to catch the bug so he could turn the bad conjure back on the person who had negatively conjured her in the first place. Now, um, what I noticed also is the conjure man or the conjure woman always wanted to get their hands on the item that was causing the person pain or discomfort. Um, sometimes you would have someone who performed a bad conjure on a person and they will make like mojo bags or they, you know, they, they would get pieces of the person's hair or some of the person's personal property. And they would take, um, you know, roots and herbs and other things and they would put them inside of like a, a pouch, flannel pouches or some type of um, cloth or material. They would sew it up or stitch it up and they would um, say words over that to 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 give it the negative power that it had and they would either physically put it like on a, on a person's body in a person's pocket in a person's shoe um underneath the corner of a person's mattress the person that they was trying to conjure but they will put it somewhere in close proximity to that individual's body and that would cause the negative conjure and so a lot of times in order to break the spell, so to speak, the conjure man or the conjure woman would want to get their hands on that item that was used for the negative conjure. And so you see here, the conjure man wanted to get the bug that came out the individual's ear, but they weren't able to do it. OK, they weren't able to do it. The bug got away. And unfortunately, um, Aunt Julian died. Um, Aunt Julian actually passed away. They got the bug out of her ear, but she passed away. And the conjurer said if they had caught the bug, um, she would have lived because he would have been able to complete the process of the actual conjure, right? Uh, now, um, before we go to the next story, what I want to do is I want to ask you a question. And I want you to, you ain't got to answer this, just think about it because I'm finna going to a, a answer to the question anyway. But when you hear a story like this, is it, or are you automatically predisposed to write it off? Okay. Oh, the conjure man said that she had a bug in her head. The bug came out of her ear. The bug flew around the room. He said if he caught the bug, he would have healed her, blah, 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 blah. Um, a lot of times it's easy for people 
to write off our spiritual and religious practices as superstitious that hold no weight, hold no value, have have no um, connection to reality as we know reality. But is there any reality? Can somebody in reality have a bug in their head? And can a bug be in someone's head and can it come out their ear? And can a bug in someone's ear or someone's head cause them discomfort and negativity? And is there any type of medicine? And can you rub someone's head to get the bug out of their head or out of their ear? It, 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 it may sound crazy when I put it in the context of a conjure man or a conjure woman, but there is actually a real, real world um, um, um significance to to this type of talk now i'm not saying that this is exactly what it is but before we go to the next story i just want to show you guys something to um just to show you the possibility that the story can be real because you know i i believe that that happened exactly how they said that it happened but everybody doesn't have the type of uh faith in um our ancestors or history that i have um so um quite often People get bugs in their ears um, and they they crawl as deep into the ear canal um, um, as their size will allow. And they can cause discomfort. They can cause pain and they can cause medical problems. And they can actually cause a person to have fits, um, kick, scream, fight. And it can really it can it, it can really mess you up if, if you don't get that bug out of there. I remember one time when I was younger, I had a brother. One of my brothers literally had to go to the hospital because um, a roach, a roach had crawled into his ear. So in, in my own life, it's, it's not even it's not even hard for me to understand a bug being in somebody's head because a bug was in my brother's head. But luckily, the doctor was able to um, get it out. But um, just check this out. Let's just read um, what they say about safely removing a bug from your ear. OK, a bug in your ear, a bug in your head. And this isn't coming from a conjure man or a conjure woman, but it's the same thing. Look, below are actions you can take to remove a bug from your ear. As you review them, remember that you should not use a cotton swab, tweezers or other items to remove a bug from your ear. Attempting to do so can push the insect deeper into your ear canal worsening the problem and potentially causing hearing loss. Try the following to remove a bug from your ear. Tilt your head to the side and gently shake it to try and dislodge the insect with the help of gravity. Don't hit or vigorously manipulate your ear, which can cause other problems. I'm going to say it again. Tilt your head to the side and gently shake it to try and dislodge the insect with the help of gravity. Don't hit or vigorously manipulate the ear, tilt the head, which can cause other problems if you vigorously manipulate the ear. Now stop, pause. What did the conjure man do? What did the conjure man do? Look, the um, show enough he got one to come and see her, a conjure man, and give her some medicine. This old man said she had bugs in her head. And after giving her the medicine, he started rubbing her head. While he rubbed her head, he said, there's a bug in her head. It looks just like a big black roach. OK, so the conjure man to alleviate the bug being in her head, he gave her medicine and then he began to rub, gently rub her head. So and she's on the bed and he's saying that the bug was going to come out on the pillow. So apparently he got her head tilted towards the pillow. He's rubbing her head and he's giving her medicine to get the bug out her head. And he says, it looks like a big black roach. So obviously he's seeing something. And he says, now he's going to come out of her head through her ear, right? What are, what are they telling you in, in, in modern science? Tilt your head to the side and gently shake it. He's rubbing the head, shaking it, to dislodge the insect with the help of gravity. 
Don't hit or vigorously manipulate your ear, which could cause other problems. They also say flush the bug out by carefully pouring warm water into your ear. If you know the bug is still alive, you can attempt to suffocate it by pouring a small amount of vegetable oil into your ear. Remember, he gave her some type of medicine. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that she took the medicine, she swallowed the medicine, or he rubbed the medicine on her body somewhere. It just says he gave her medicine. And he, he possibly could have had gave her something akin to the vegetable oil or the warm water that he that he created. And he was slowly putting that into her ear as he tilted her ear and rubbed her head to dislodge the insect and get it out of her ear. OK, but since he says it, how he says it, an individual will try to write it off. But there are actual um, 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 there are actual accounts of people with bugs in their heads or bugs in their ears. And when they say how to safely remove it, they're basically telling you to do exactly what the conjure man did. Now, the only difference is with this particular bug, this, this wasn't a random bug that went into her ear. Someone had put um, bad juju on the woman and put a bad conjure on the woman that caused the bug to go into her ear. And um, unfortunately, without the conjure man getting his hands on the bug itself to perform his own conjure to break the spell, uh, on Julian um, died. She, she, she died. R.I.P. R.I.P. But um, just think about that. When we try to say that the ancestors, you know, oh, it, it was all uh, fake medicinal sciences. No, the what the ancestor did was exactly what you are supposed to do in that situation. Only it's the only difference is the ancestor dealt with the physical bug in the ear and the supernatural cause of the bug being in the ear. OK, they not only treated the, 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 the physical and the natural, they also treated the spiritual as well. So moving on to the next story. Um, now, this story, we're going to be talking about tarot card readers, supernatural sight, an actual conjure potion and more. Now, this is this is real interesting because we're going to see firsthand accounts of uh we're going to see the ingredients right we're going to see the actual ingredients of a conjure um um uh, uh, of a conjure potion or a conjure mix we're going to see not only that they gave them medicine we're going to see what the medicine consisted of we're going to see what the medicine consisted of and how it was actually used okay so in this next story uh miss emmeline heard son Albert heard begins to suffer from a knot in his right side that causes him great pain. The pain is so intense that he cannot even bend over to tie his own shoes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Miss Emmeline is advised to take Albert to a conjure woman named Miss Hirschpath, who urges who wait, I'm sorry, who uses hoodoo to diagnose Albert's condition and to prescribe a cure. Now, Miss Hirschpath is a legit hoodoo practitioner. Um, you know, she's long since passed away, but it would have been amazing to meet someone, um, someone like this, right? It would have been amazing to meet someone like this. And you're gonna see in this new story, just like in the other story, someone suggests that Miss Emmeline goes to see the particular conjure woman again. All throughout our history, the conjure man and the conjure woman, the root worker, the hoodoo practitioner, whatever term you want to use to call it, um, they were right there every step of the way helping our ancestors get through the most traumatic experience um, um, a group of people probably went through in, in all of human history. OK, so we can't undermine the significance of what they did. And um, a lot of what they did helped our ancestors when doctors couldn't help. OK, that's, that's, that's just we just got to be real about that. We just got to be real about that. And we have to stop letting people tell us that um, our ancestors, beliefs, traditions, cultural practices and norms are superstitious. They're fake. They're phony. 
but everything that they do is real. You know, it, it, they can pray for somebody and heal them, but the conjure man and conjure woman can't create medicine and heal them. That's foolishness. If the conjure man and conjure woman is fake, everybody is fake. The priest, the pastor, the imam, everybody fake. Everybody fake. Don't tell me what you can do if, if you discount what uh, our ancestors could do. I just don't like that at all. So uh, let's let's get into the story. Now look, check this out. She says, the next story is a true story. The facts as told by Miss Heard were also witnessed by her as it deals with the conjuring of one of her sons. It is related in her exact words as nearly as possible. I got a son named Albert Heard. He is living and well, but child, there was a time when he was almost to his grave. I was living in town then, and Albert and his wife was living in the country with their two children. Well, Albert got down sick, and he and he would go to doctors and go to doctors, but they didn't do him any good. Remember the last story? The uh, uh, Aunt Julian went to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor, and the doctors couldn't help. Why? Because the doctors were only focused on the physical and the natural. When um, the problem was physical, natural, and spiritual. And our people, when dealing with healing, you have to heal the physical and the spiritual together. You know, it's not one or the other. It, 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 it's, it's, they're interconnected. They're interconnected. And so when the doctors couldn't help, our ancestors would realize that, oh, this is physical, this is spiritual. I need um um I need the conjure man, I need the conjure woman, I need the root work. Anyway, she says, I was worried to death because I had to run backwards and forwards, and it was a strain on me. He was suffering with a knot on his right side, and he couldn't even fasten his shoes because it pained him so. And it was so bad he couldn't even button up his pants. A woman teach school out there by the name of Miss Yancey. She's dead now, but she lived right here on Randolph Street years ago. Well, one day when I was leaving Albert's house, I met her on the way from her school. Good evening, Miss Heard, she says. How is Mr. Albert? I don't hardly know, I says, because he don't get no better. She looked at me kind of funny and said, don't you believe he's hurt? Yes, ma'am, I said. I sure do. Well, she says, I've been wanting to say something to you concerning this, but I didn't know how you would take it. So um, sometimes when an individual, like think about it, sometimes when an individual is sick and you can't figure out what's wrong with them, some people may think that, oh, you're faking. Maybe you're faking like you're sick. Or even if you're going to the doctor, you're going to doctor after doctor after doctor. And the doctor is saying, hey, well, there's nothing wrong with him or her. I can't find anything wrong with them. And so an individual may start questioning, are you really sick? Do you really have a knot in your side? Are you really in pain? Because the doctors say that they can't do nothing for you. And the doctors are acting like they don't see anything that's wrong with you. Right. And so this this school teacher she lives in the area that Albert lives in. So she's privy to the, 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 his plight. She's privy to his story. She's privy to his plight. And so since she has a connection with a conjure woman, she is understanding that, okay, it's possible that Albert has been conjured because the doctors can't help. But she didn't know if Miss Heard believed in hoodoo or not. Because a lot of our ancestors, they were Christian and they turned their backs on their ancestral practices. So she didn't know if she should bring it up to her at, at, or not. But eventually she got up the gut. She went to and she asked, hey, how's your son, Mr. Albert? And when um, the ancestor tell us, oh, I don't, you know, I, it's hard to say that he's he not getting no better. And so the school teacher, Ms. Yancey, said, well, do you even believe that he's really hurt? She's saying, like, um, I, I know what the doctors are saying, but do you believe that it's something more going on that the doctors cannot address with the physical? And Miss Hurd says yes. Right? Miss Sir says yes. So Miss Yancey say, okay, that's all she wanted to know. He said, Well, look, I've been wanting to tell you something concerning this situation with your son, but I didn't know how you would take it. 
But now that she had a slight conversation with her and she sees that Miss Heard is open to the possibility that, yes, her son is hurt. No, the doctors can't pinpoint the cause, but she believes that he's hurt. She's like, I'm going to explain to you what's really going on now that I know that you, you can possibly accept it. Now that I know that you can possibly accept the truth. So the school teacher says, if I tell you somewhere to go, will you go and tell them I sent you? Yes, ma'am. I will do anything if Albert can get better. All right, then, she says, catch the federal prison car and get off at Butler Street. In them days, that car came down Forest Ave. When you get to Butler Street, she says, walk up to Clifton Street and go to such and such a number. Knock on the door and a woman by the name of Miss Hirschpad will come to the door. Before she let you in, she go ask who sent you there. When you tell her, she'll let you in. So now we're seeing um, the, the, the teacher, Miss Yancey, is advising uh ancestor her to go see the conjure woman right so she gives her directions to the um conjure woman's house and she tell her when she knock on the door a lady named miss her's path is going to come now before she even let you in you're gonna have to tell her who sent you there so this particular conjure woman this is why i say she's the real deal because she has several things set in place Right, she has several things set in place to ensure her own safety and security, and she doesn't just um go out and solicit people. She she isn't she doesn't have a sign up that says I'm a conjure woman and give me money. She isn't in it for money. She she she's the real deal. She's the real deal, and she only takes people by um reference. Okay because she knows that she's helped somebody. And then if that person sees somebody that they already trust, they can send her to her and, and she'll help them too if they use that name, that reference. But what I wanna do for you guys, I'm gonna take you guys back in time and I'm gonna show you guys the general area where Miss Hirschpad actually lived. Now pay attention. You see how the ancestor says that she was told to catch the federal prison car and get off at Butler Street. Now a lot of you may be wondering what is a federal prison car? What does that even mean? So before I get deeper into the story, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use some historical context to this part of the story just because I like to teach. So um, the federal prison car is a street car or a trolley or a tram. There were various names for it. OK, so this is what the ancestor was talking about. Um, now, check this out. Street cars originally operated in Atlanta downtown and into the surrounding areas from 1871 until the final line's closure in 1949. So remember, the ancestor was interviewed in 1936 and she's talking about a time period you know a few several years before that so this is what she's talking about a streetcar a trolley or a tram one of these that is described as operating in atlanta downtown and surrounding areas from 1871 until 1949 the first such transportation began with horse cars in 1871 and electric streetcar service started in the 1880s. In addition to streetcars in Atlanta proper, there were also interurban inter railways from Atlanta to outlying towns. The last streetcar service on the old network ended in 1949. The streetcar system was quickly replaced by a trolley bus system and with buses. Now, remember, back in the day, everybody didn't have cars like they have today. Nowadays, everybody, you know, everybody has cars or they know somebody with a car that can pick them up and take them somewhere. Or they, you know, they get on the bus. Some cities don't even have buses, but they, you know, they can get on the Greyhound. They can go wherever they wanted to go. But back during the time of the ancestor, Miss Emmeline heard, this is how individuals travel. Now, I want to I want you to pay attention. Now we're talking about the ancestor living uh in McDo in, in McDonald, Georgia. 
but this is talking about street cars operating in Atlanta downtown and surrounding areas. Remember what I told you in the beginning? I told you it was going to make sense, right? I told you it was going to make sense. Now, look, McDonald, Georgia is a city in Henry County, Georgia, United States. It is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. It is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. Now, I take the time to point out these small facts and to verify these small facts because I want you to know that you can trust the ancestors' oral history. They're, they're telling you how it actually is. So these were the streetcars. And again, you may hear them called trolleys or you may hear them called trams. But this is how people got around the cities and the surrounding areas of major cities back during the time of our ancestors um, fresh out of slavery. So when the ancestor talks about federal prison car, this is what she's referring to. But why is she calling it a uh, federal prison car? What, what relevance does that have? Now, in McDonald, Georgia, there is McDonald Boulevard. And the Atlanta federal prison is on that street. Now, this, but there was a particular streetcar, tram, or trolley that went uh, uh, to the federal prison and to, you know, surrounding areas. But they called it the federal prison car because this was the streetcar that would take you to the federal prison. That would go by the federal prison. Look what they say about the Atlanta Federal uh, Penitentiary. The Atlanta Federal Penitentiary had its share of famous inmates over the years, including several who have inspired characters in Hollywood films. Here are some of those inmates and the films that you might know them from, along with other famous prisoners of the facility. And they, they gave a list deeper on in the article. But check this out. But first, some history. The penitentiary was first conceived in 1891 with the Three Prisons Act, which also created the federal prison system. Along with Leavenworth and McNeil Island, the Atlanta facility would be among the first three operated by the Department of Justice. Its location on McDonald Boulevard was established by another act of Congress in 1899. And by 1902, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary was taking its first prisoners. It would soon hold some of the country's biggest names in organized crime. So um, regardless of what you knew prior to this video about federal prisons and when they were actually built, and if you were wondering if there were any, even any federal prisons in the area during the time of our ancestor, yes, it was. And you had streetcars that went by that particular um uh, you had streetcars that went by that particular prison. So when the ancestor says, catch the federal prison car and get off at Butler Street, that's the federal prison she's talking about. And she's talking about the streetcars that went down um, that area. Now, look, let's look at the directions that she gives. She says, you catch the federal prison car, excuse me, and get off at Butler Street. In them days, that car came down Forest Ave. When you get to Butler Street, she says, walk up Clifton Street and go to such and such number. So we know the street car to get on. We're getting on the one that's colloquially known as the federal prison car, right? So you get on the federal prison car. It's going to come down Forest Ave. On Forest Ave, you're going to get off at Butler Street. And from Butler Street, you're going to walk up to Clifton Street and on Clifton Street, you go to such and such a number and you will find the conjure woman, Miss Hirschpad. So what I want to do real quick, I want to show you guys. I want to show you guys a map and um, we're just going to look at what some of these areas are at. So remember, first, you take the federal prison car from McDonald to Forest Ave. So um, this is the present routes of the city of Atlanta from June 1924. So these are the present routes of some of the streetcars that I'm telling you about. So you see this highlighted portion that I have at the bottom. That's the U.S. government federal prison. 
That's the federal prison that I just told you guys about. So there's a streetcar that would take you to this federal federal prison and away from this federal prison. Now, if you go up this McDonald Street, remember, we're going to be looking for Forest Ave. Now, in this area right here, that's Forest Ave right there. OK, so the ancestor is saying you can take this federal prison car all the way up to Forest Ave. Now, when you get on Forest Ave, what did the ancestor say? Get off at Butler Street, right? Get off at Butler Street. Take Forest Ave to Butler Street and get off. Again, this is a map of Atlanta, Georgia, showing the lines of the Georgia Railway and Electric Company, 1902. So the Georgia Railway and Electric Company, they basically took over the contracts to run these, uh, these streetcars. But if you look right here, it looks like a, I have a T highlighted. The top of the quote-unquote T, that's Forest Ave that you just seen on the other map. And this one, you see that but, Butler Street. It may be kind of hard to see, but right with my hand in, I highlight it. That's Butler Street. So the ancestor is saying you take that federal prison car to Forest Ave, you get off at Butler Street. So boom, the ancestor was told to get off right here. We're following the ancestor's footsteps. And so from Butler Street, She's supposed to walk to Clifton Street. So let's look at one more map. Remember, after getting off at Butler Street, walk to Clifton Street. So this part right here that I have highlighted, this is Forest Ave. Remember, right under Forest Ave, we have Butler Street. Butler Street isn't shown on this map. But you notice there because I just showed you. Now, if you go to the right, the ancestor would have walked to the right, and this road that's highlighted, that's Clifton Road right there. So the ancestor was to get off from Forest Ave on Butler Street, where it lets you off, and just walk the rest of the way to Clifton Road or Clifton Street, and somewhere on this street is where the conjure woman um, resided, okay? So, uh... I just wanted to retrace the ancestor's steps and show you that the directions that the ancestor gave are actually legit from that time period. Now, if you look at maps today, um, a lot of those street names have changed. Roads have been reworked and um, roads have changed. So uh, you would have to look at uh, old maps to actually find that breakdown that I just gave you guys. So I, I did the work for you. OK, but look, let's go on with the story. She says, knock on the door and a woman by the name of Miss Hirschpath will come to the door. Before she lets you in, she going to ask you who sent you there. When you tell her, she'll let you in. Now, let me tell you, she keeps two quarts of whiskey all the time and you have to drink a little with her. Besides that, she cusses nearly every word she speaks. But don't let that scare you. She will show get your son up if it can be done. Show sure enough, that old woman did just like Miss Yancey said she would do. She had a harsh voice and she spoke right snappy. When she let me in, she said, sit down. You like whiskey? I said, well, I take a little drum sometimes. Well, here, take some of this, she said. I poured a little bit and drank it kind of like I was afraid. She cursed and said, I ain't going to conjure you. Drink it. She now that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before I go for it, let's stop right there. Now, check this out. You notice how Miss Yancey says whenever somebody goes to Miss Hirschpath's house, this ancestor was something else. Um, First thing she's going to do is when you knock on the door, she's going to ask who sent you. Right. Who sent you to my house? You give her a name. You give her the reference. If Miss Hirschpath know him, she'll let you in. Now, once you get in, she she says she always keeps two quarts of whiskey and you have to drink with her before she'll get into the conjure. Right. And so you see um, um, Miss uh, Emily Hurd, she verified that. Yeah. When she got there, she asked who son her. She let her in. She asked her, did she like whiskey? She said, well, you got to drink a little whiskey with me. She pulled up and was like, hey, look, I'm not trying to conjure you with the whiskey, but I wanted to see you drink the whiskey. Now, this is funny, 
right? This is funny, and you may not understand why, but I'm going to I'm going to break it down to you, right? Now, why would Miss Hirschpad want the people coming to her for the the information on Conjure to drink whiskey? What's the purpose of that? Um, have you guys? Uh, hold on, just a second. Uh, Mama G. Hey, wait, welcome back, welcome back, Mama G. She says, Grand Rising, Mr. Daniels, I'll have to catch this from the beginning. Yeah, whenever whenever you get time, go back. Go back and uh, check it out. I already told one story and I already gave a lot of information. So, yeah, we need deep into it. We need deep into it. But thank you for showing up when you did. Thank you for showing up when you did. Now, check this out. Have you guys, uh, and this is going to be kind of a weird reference, but you're going to get it in a second. Have you guys ever seen, like, movies when... Um, like it's a drug deal or something going on, right? It's a drug deal going on. And um, the person who's the big dog who's selling the drugs, they meet somebody new. And when they meet somebody new, they don't know if they're like an undercover cop or not. So they're like, they're like, hey, uh, hit hit this weed. I want to hit see you hit this weed. Or they'll give them some coke and they'll be like, hey, snort this. And the individual that they're trying to make sure is not a cop, they would have to do something illegal, <laughs> right? They would have to do something illegal in front of the big dog to prove that, you know, that they're not a cop or to prove that they can be trusted or to prove that they don't, they don't have no ill intentions. It'd be like, now, uh, Lauren Mathis says, hey, brother. Hey, hey, sis. Hey, sis. What's up? Thanks for tapping in. Thank you for tapping in, man. Great to see you. Great to have you, man. Appreciate all you guys. Appreciate all of you guys. One love, one love. So they would have the person do something illegal. If you watch movies, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So why would Miss Hirschpad want everybody that comes to her house to drink whiskey with her before she fully trusts them and she gets into the conjure and she gets into the hoodoo practices? Now, check this out. I'm going to give you guys some more historical context. I love teaching history. Now, who is familiar with uh, prohibition, right? The nowadays, um, you can, uh, okay, Ian Williams, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Watch this. I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm about to make it make sense. Um, if you don't know, prohibition is referring to a time in America's past when it was illegal to purchase, sell, consume alcohol. They made it illegal, right? Now, what I'm proposing is Miss Hirschpad likely made Emmeline drink whiskey to prove she could be trusted since this likely took place during Georgia's years of prohibition. Now, remember, I showed you guys in the beginning uh, Brooklyn Zoo, Brooklyn Zoo, hotel, hotel, King, thanks for tapping in, fam, thanks for tapping in. Now, look, I showed you guys in the beginning that these interviews were conducted December 4th and 5th, 1936. So she was interviewed in 1936, and she was talking about events that happened several years prior to her being interviewed. Now, look at this. In 1907, Georgia, where this is taking place, Georgia became the first state in the South to pass a statewide ban on the production, transportation, and sale of alcohol. Prohibition in Georgia lasted until 1935, two years after the repeal of the 18th Amendment and the end of national prohibition. So in Georgia, it was illegal to buy sell, consume alcohol from 1907 to 1935. Now, the ancestor is being interviewed in December of 1936, and she's talking about events that happened several years prior, right smack dab in the middle of prohibition. So now when you read the story, you get a little more context to what's going on. Miss Hirschpad, the conjure woman, she always keeps two quarts of whiskey. Illegal, <laughs> illegal whiskey. This is illegal whiskey that she has acquired from the moonshiners, right? Because people are still drinking, but they were that they, they were drinking from the moonshiners, the people who were making illegal whiskey and um um getting it here and getting it there and dropping it off. 
So it was like a, a underground alcohol trade, just like it's an underground drug trade right now. So those two quarts of whiskey was illegal. If she was caught with that, she could really be, uh, you know, uh, criminally prosecuted. So Miss Hirschpad, whenever somebody would come for her hoodoo conjuring, she would make them drink whiskey with her. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, it's illegal, but hey, you want you want my help? You got to prove you can't be trusted. You you got to prove you you know you ain't you know you got to prove you ain't somebody with a questionable background. You have to prove you're not here for no illicit purposes. First off, I need you to tell me who sent you to my house. Think of it. <laughs> I need you to tell me who sent you to my house. Then I need you to drink some of this illegal whiskey with me. Now, after you do that, it's like, okay, you passed the test. Let's get down to business. Let's get down to business. I, I thought that was funny when I uh when I when I read it in the uh in the story about her making them uh making them drink the whiskey, it automatically kicked in my head. I was like, you know what? That's during prohibition. She's not even supposed to have that whiskey, but I get it. Because I do have a past, you know, I have been in the streets in the past and I, I, I understand trying to validate that, you know, somebody can be trusted or not. But anyway, after Emily and hers drink the whiskey, check this out. She talking about um the conjure woman, Miss Hirschpath, she got the cards and told me to cut them. So I did. Now, um, it, it doesn't explicitly say, but we can reasonably deduce that the cards she got were what we know today as tarot cards. Um, one thing our ancestors did, they also um, they also used cards for divination. And when you're talking about divination, um, divination is a way to acquire like spiritual information, spiritual knowledge. It's a way to gain information that you can't gain um, naturally, right? You 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 use the divination to to interpret, understand things that the gods or the ancestors in another realm may be trying to show you or tell you to answer a question um, for you, right? So when Miss Hurd came to her. Um, she had her drink the whiskey and she wanted her to kind of tell her, you know, a little bit about, you know, why she's there or, you know, who sent her, what is this all about in order to get an understanding of what's really going on with her son. She, uh, resorted to means of divination and part of her means of divination, she, um, was using tarot cards. And so we don't see the, the full process, but we see she got the cards. I'm not sure if she shuffled them or not, but then she gave them to Miss Heard to cut. And so Miss Heard herself cut the cards. And then um, you know how it goes. Then the individual who is doing the reading will, you know, flip over the card that's on top. They would see it and then they would interpret what that card means. And as they flip the cards over, the cards would tell them what is going on. And so we're going to see if, through means of divination, did Miss Hirschpad actually get accurate information? Spoiler alert, yes, she did. So look, she says she got the cards and told me to cut them. So I did. Looking at the cards, she said, you like to wait too long. They got him marching to the cemetery. So the first thing she noticed when she looked at the cards was like, hey, you almost were too late. Right. If you would have got here any later, your son was going to die. Now, I put this dead terror cord on the screen just as a visual representation. I have no way of knowing if this is the card that she saw that told her that her um, her son, Albert, was headed to the actual grave, headed to the cemetery. But one of the cards she saw let her know that her son was headed to the um, grave if this conjure wasn't taken care of. And remember, the pre in the first story, the um, Aunt Julian, who had the bug in her ear, um, since the conjure man didn't get his hands on the bug, it did lead to Aunt Julian's death. So um, a bad conjure, a negative conjure can result in the death of an individual, especially if you wait too long. There's a lot of instances where an individual was conjured and conjured bad and they, they the conjure wasn't broken fast enough. And so they unfortunately died. So, look, 
Miss Hirsch Path goes on to say, the poor thing, I'll fix those devils. A profane word was used instead of devils. Remember, she cusses a lot. So she didn't say devils. She probably them MF and devils, them damn devils. She, she, you know, she cussed them out. And what she's talking about, those devils, um, not necessarily just spiritual devils or spiritual entities. She's talking about whoever put the conjure on him. That's the devil. Uh, remember, conjuring and hoodoo, it can be used for good or bad. There's a there's a duality to the world. There is no good without evil, no evil without good, no how without cold, no up without down, no left without right, no male without female. There is a duality to the world. And when you're talking about the spirit world and you're talking about spiritual forces and spiritual energies and spiritual powers, there's good power, there's bad power, there's good power, there's evil power, right? There's righteousness and there's wickedness. OK, some people use conjuring to heal. Some people use conjuring to hurt. It's just a reality. It's just a reality of how it goes. OK, just like a just like you as an individual, you as an individual with free will, um, working limbs, you can use your hands to build something or you can use your hands to tear down. You can use your hands and your intelligence to heal or you can use your hands and your intelligence to harm. Right. You, you can you, you you can take someone's life if you so choose. So it's all about what an individual chooses to do with not only their physical, natural power, but their spiritual power as well. Some people tap into that spiritual power to do evil, but some people tap into that spiritual power to do good. And it will try to kind of balance it out. So Miss um, um, Hirsch Path is saying that she's going to fix those devils, those bad conjurers. A profane word was used instead of devils. So look what Miss Hirsch Pass says. He got a knot on his side, ain't he? Yes, ma'am, I said. So based on the divination, Miss Hirsch Pass saw with her spiritual eyes that the problem with um, Mrs. Hirsch's son was he had a knot on his side. And so when she sees that, she actually was like, oh, so he, he got a knot on his side. And um, Miss Heard was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am, he does. So then, she, look, she says, Miss Heard says, that woman told me everything that was wrong with Albert and exactly how he acted. So Miss Heard didn't tell her everything. She basically told her why she was there. But the, through means of divination, Miss Heard Pat told her everything that was wrong with Albert and exactly how he acted. Now, she could have easily said that, oh, she only said that because I told her, or, you know, or she wouldn't have believed her if, if it was some kind of a game. But the divination that Miss Hirsch Pat used, it actually worked. She, she saw with spiritual sight what that young man was going through. And there are people like that today. There are people like that today who they, they may dream dreams or they, they may be around somebody and get a feeling and they know things about what someone is going through without that person actually telling them. And they know how to perform divination to get an answer from the spiritual realm. All of this is true. All of this is real. OK, um, look, she says all at once. She said, Miss Hirschpath said, if them, that's probably damned. If them damn things had hatched in him, it would have been too late. Now, pause. Look, she's saying that that knot is something in him. And if it had hatched in him, it would have been too late. Remember, I told you they like to use references to animals being inside of a person uh, as it relates to the conjure. Um, because she's saying that not in him was something that could hatch inside of him and kill him. Remember, the uh, first story that I read, they were talking about um, the conjure man said that it was a bug in the lady's head and he had to get the bug to come out through her ear. I've read another story where they said that an individual was conjured and they had a snake. They had a snake in their body. The conjurer put a snake in their body. So you will see. When they're talking about conjuring, you'll see this concept over and over and over and over and over that when somebody conjures, they uh, put something 
through means of the conjure inside of an individual's body that causes harm, discomfort, pain, and uh, ultimately um, it can lead to death if it's not taken care of. So she says, if you do exactly like I tell you, I'll get him up from there. I show sure will, I told her. Well, there's a stable sets east of his house. His house got three rooms and a path goes straight to the stable. I see it there where he hangs his harness. Yes, I see it all, the devils. So look, Ms. Hirschpath is saying that she sees it all. She sees this man's house, Albert's house. She sees that he has three rooms in his house. And she sees that there's a horse stable east of his house and a path that goes from his house to the stables. And look, she's saying, I see it there where he hangs his harness. What is she talking about? They don't go into explicit detail, but I'm surmised that that's where the conjure was placed. Remember, when they conjure somebody in a bad way, they get something personal of theirs, they do the bad juju, and they put it somewhere close to that person's physical person, right? Where it can actually have the, the effect when it's in close proximity of them. So I believe when she says, I see it there where he hangs his harness because Albert would go to the, the stable, hang his harness, and that's where he would do his work. That's where they put the, the, the conjure bag or the mojo bag that was causing him the pain. OK, that was causing him the pain. That's where it was at. And she was saying, OK, I see it through my spiritual eye. She is seeing where he lives and where he works and how he gets there because she is trying to ascertain how he was conjured. What are they using to conjure him? Because it's, it's important to understand the conjure to break the conjure. OK, it's, it's imperative that you understand what the bad conjurer did in order for the good conjurer to perform their work and heal you. So, look, she says, yes, I see it all. The devils. So then she says, have you got any money? Miss Heard responds. Yes, ma'am. A little. I said. And she says, all right, then. Um, all right, then. She said, go to the drugstore and get five cents worth of blue stone, five cents wheat bran. Now, they're about to go into the actual ingredients of the concoction. But before they do, again, I'm going to give you guys a little more historical context because I like I like to teach history. I want, I want you to be able to visualize it in your mind exactly what our ancestors were experiencing. So you see how she tells her to go to the drug store. Now, this isn't Walgreens. This isn't CVS, okay? This isn't, um, when I was young, they also had something called Eckers, Eckers uh, Pharmacy. That's not the drugstore that they're talking about. Um, this is, hold on just a second. This is an, um, an example of an African-American-owned drugstore that operated in Georgia. Now, unfortunately, um, due to a lack of historical records, we don't know exactly where in Georgia this was. So I can't say that this was the drugstore referenced in the um, in the ancestors literature. But this is the African-American drugstore in Georgia. And possibly this is the one that they were talking about. This picture was taken in like 1899. So it operated during the time of Miss Hirschpath and Miss Heard, and it was African American owned, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if um, there was an African American owned drugstore um, in the area during that time, that's where they would have went. Okay, but this is Mr. Um, Doctor McDougal's drugstore. Now, in these drugstores, they had um, naturopathic medicines, right? They also had what we consider to be drugs today, like they had stuff with cocaine in it. OK, they, they had stuff with like strong drugs in it because this was before you had the, uh, the FDA. This was before some of these substances were deemed illegal. OK, so they had really, really strong substances that you could just go into the drugstore like this and buy. And a lot of those things you could just go in there and buy over the counter are illegal today. 
And it's, it's illegal to have and illegal to use. But back in those days, you could just go in there and get them. And a lot of times, these these places house the ingredients that an individual needed. So when when you when you read about a hoodoo potion or a hoodoo concoction or a hoodoo recipe, they would say, okay, you need this, you need this, you need this, and you need this. So you can go down to the local drugstore, you can buy what you need. And um, you can you can mix it and you can make the medicine, you can make the potions, you can make the remedies um, um, and apply them. OK, you can make the remedies and apply them. But um, let's get into the actual uh, formula itself. Look, she said, go to the drugstore and get five cents worth of blue stone, five cents wheat brand. And go to a fish market and ask them to give you a little fish brine. Then go in the woods and get some poke root berries. Now, there's two kinds of poke root berries, the red skin and the white skin berry. Put all this in a pot, mix it, mix with it the guts from a green gourd and nine parts of red pepper. Make a poultice and put to its side and put to his side on that night. So we see the ingredients. We have blue stone, wheat bran, fish brine, poke root berries, green gourd guts, and nine parts red pepper. Now you take all of this and you make a poultice out of it, okay? And so anybody who wants, you can take a screenshot of that. You can write those ingredients down um, you can mix those together in your own free time and uh, see what you get out of it. And perhaps if you're feeling some kind of inflammation or some kind of knot somewhere on your body, um, perhaps you would like to try what Miss Hirsch pad um, prescribed for them. You could try that. None of that stuff, making it to a, a poultice and putting it on the skin, not going to kill you. You don't have to ingest it or anything like that. And you can see for yourself if that hoodoo formula actually work but you see where it says uh make it into a postist uh what is a postist what are they talking about look a postist also called a cataplasm is a soft moist mass often heated and medicated that is spread on cloth and placed over the skin to treat an it an aching inflamed or painful part of the body it can be used on wounds such as cuts. Now, why am I doing this? Because you see the medical benefits of what the ancestor is talking about. She is not just making stuff up. She's dealing with the natural and the spiritual at the exact same time. She's giving her the ingredients to make a hoodoo postage. And she's telling her to put it on the knot. On her on her son's side and this is exactly uh, uh what a post is this for is placed over the skin to treat an aching inflamed or painful part of the body so her telling her to make a post this and put it on the, on top of his skin to treat an aching inflamed or painful part of his body the knot that's actually medically relevant right and it's medically the correct thing to do and the ingredients are the ingredients that she told her what to use to make it. But to make the posters and use it in that manner is, is, is medically accurate. What the ancestor said is medically accurate. But she's also not only dealing with the natural medical portion of it, she's also dealing with healing the spiritual as well. Now, um, look, with this inflammation treatment, I thought this was interesting. Because, look, they say the attendant effect of the postis is to cool the horse's legs. Now, they're describing how to put the postis on a horse, but you can also use it on humans as well. But she says um, the intended effect of the postis is to cool the horse's legs over a long period of time. Remember that you use a postis over a long period of time by drawing heat out of the leg through evaporation. It is a common practice to bandage over the posters using bandages and bandage fillers and to place either wet newspaper or cellophane wrap between the posters and bandages. Yet, bandaging over the posters may also prevent the action of heat evaporation and therefore prevent cooling, i.e. heat can't escape. 
right? Now remember, so the effect, the idea when you put the posters on there is to cool the wound, to, to draw out the heat, to draw out the negative elements of whatever is causing the inflammation or the pain or the aching. And it is meant to be used over a long period of time. This isn't something you put on and five minutes later you heal. Did the ancestor know that, right? Did the ancestor know that? Let's go further. We'll find out. So look, she says, now listen, your son will be afraid and think you are trying to do something to him, but be gentle and persuade him that it's for his own good. Now, some of our ancestors were afraid of conjuring and they were afraid of the conjure doctors because, again, conjuring could be used to hurt you. So um, when they didn't know if the conjuring was going to be used to heal or harm, they, 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 they were afraid. Now, why would they be afraid of conjuring if it wasn't real? That's a question you have to ask yourself. But look, she says, um, um, child, he sure did act funny when I told him I wanted to treat his side. I had to tell him I was carrying out doctor's orders so he could get well. So when she said that it was a medical doctor that gave her this advice, the, the son um, accepted it. But uh, when um, but she couldn't tell him that it was from a conjurer. Look, she says he reared and fussed and said he didn't want that mess on him. I told him the doctor says you do very well till you go to the horse lot. Then you go blind and you can't see. He looked at me. Show sure enough, Ma, he said, that show is the truth. So now remember, the uh, conjure woman said that the conjure appeared to be right in the location of where he would hang his harness out towards the horse stables where he worked. And so she's saying that the doctor said that he would be doing well sometimes but then as he went out into the stables when he'll go out there to the horse lot he would go blind and can't see meaning something negative would happen to him right when he got in the vicinity of the 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 mojo bag that was performing the bad conjuring in close proximity you feel the negative effect and so he said damn mama you how did you you weren't supposed to know that but that but that's the truth that's the truth and so he began to believe that this medicine could help him. She says, I have to always call what well, he said, the son. I have to always call one of the children when I go there because I can't see how to get back to the house. So whenever we went out to the horse stable, he would pass by the place where he would put his harness. That's where the mojo bag was at. He would begin to go blind and he would not be able to find his way back to the house. And he would have to call one of his children to come and help guide him back. And when he was able to be guided back, he would be able to see again that it is far away from the mojo bag, but he still had the knot in his side because there's something placed inside of his body with the conjure that if it hatches, he's going to die. Look, he says, well, that convinced him and he let me fix the medicine for him when she had information that she wasn't supposed to know. But that information was gathered through divination, right? divination got her that information look i put him to bed and made a postage then i put it to his side now this woman said no one was to take it off the next morning but me i was supposed to fix three one each night and after taking each one off to bury it like dead folks is buried east and west and to make a real grave out of each one. Now we're dealing with the spiritual side as well. Now remember, a post is, let me go back, let me go back. Look, um, the intended effect of the post is, is to cool the horse's legs over a long period of time by drawing heat out. So the post is, draws out the heat over a long period of time. Now, Miss Hirschpad, the conjure woman, told her she needs to do this three nights in a row, a.k.a. a long period of time. Now, in the natural world, the postis is supposed to be drawing out heat and impurities from the, the affected area that's, that's, that's aching and inflamed and in pain. 
but it's also dealing with the spiritual aspect because he was negatively conjured. So in addition to that, she told her, when you take the posters off, when you take the medicine off the night, what I want you to do is to take it outside and bury it, but bury it just like dead folks are buried east to west and make a real grave out of each one. Now that is to deal with the spiritual side of the negative conjure. Not only is it drawing out the heat from the affected area, it is also drawing out the bad conjure. And in drawing out the bad conjure, it needs to be disposed of in a particular way, a ritualistic way, burying it, killing it, right? making sure that it can it, 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 it cannot harm her son anymore and she was supposed to do this for three nights in a row and every morning take it off make a new grave and bury it so miss her says well when i told him to not move it the next morning but let me move it he got funny again and wanted to know why now she can't tell him that she wants to bury it because then he'll know it's a contract and he's afraid of conjure. Um, do you know I had to play like I could move it without messing up my bed clothes? And if he moved it, he might waste it all. Finally, he said he would call me the next morning. Sure enough, the next morning he called me. Ma, Ma, come take it off. I went in the room and he was smiling. I slept all night long, he said, and I feel so much better. I'm so glad, I said. And do you know he could reach down and fasten his shoe? And it had been a long time since he could do that. Now, this is after day one, he began to feel the positive effects of the posters that 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 um that his mother made at the request of uh Miss Hirschpath. Now, in the beginning, he said that he couldn't even lean over to tie his own shoe, and it was hard for him to even button up his pants. But after one night, with the posters, the hoodoo woman's posters on him. He woke up feeling good. He was smiling. He said he, that was the best sleep he had in a long time. And he could even bend over and tie a shoe. So um, the, it, it, it was working. Look, later that day, I slipped out and made my first grave under the fig bush in the garden. I even put up headboards too. So she buried it just like she was told, just like people are buried east to west. And she says she even gave it a headboard, like a tombstone. That night, Albert said, Mama, fix another one. I feel so much better. So now that he's seen the positive effects of the posters, where at first he was not sure that he wanted it, and he was saying, I don't want that mess on me. Now he's begging Mama, hey, Mama, do it again, do it again. Dad, I feel so good. I want another good sleep like that. Put that posters on me, Mama. So um, she says, I sure will, I said. Thank God you're better. So for three nights, I fixed postuses and put to his side. And each morning, he would tell me how much better he felt. Then the last morning, I was fixing breakfast and he sat in the next room. After a while, Albert jumped up and hollered, Ma, Ma, what is it? I said, Mama, that knot is gone. It dropped down in my pants. What? I cried. Where is it? Child, we looked, but we didn't find anything. But the knot had so gone. So um, after following what the hoodoo practitioner told her, the knot, he's saying the knot fell down in his pants and basically disappeared. So whatever it was that was in him that was preparing to hatch was successfully killed and buried. Um, on a physical at, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a physical level and on a spiritual level, the 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 problem was taken care of. And so uh, look, she says the woman, um, Miss Hirschpad, the woman had told me to come back when the knot moved and she would tell me what else to do. So um, after she left Miss Hirschpad and Miss Hirschpad told her what to do, she said uh, when the knot moves, I want you to come back and see me because she knew that after applying this postage three nights in a row, that the knot would move The knot would uh, dislodge itself. Whatever was in his body would dislodge itself. It will fall. It would die. 
because it was being buried. It was taken out of his skin and it was buried. So the physical and the spiritual was being healed at the same time. Um, our ancestors, they always dealt with these physical and spiritual at the same time. That's that's just how they work. So she says that same day I went to see her, went to see Miss Hirschpad. And when I told her, she just shouted, I fixed them, the devils. So she knew that she had won. She was happy that her conjure defeated the bad conjure. Now, she says, do you know where you can get a few leaves off a yellow peach tree? It must be a yellow peach tree, though. Yes, ma'am, I says to her. I have a yellow peach tree right there in my yard. Well, she says, get a handful of leaves, then take a knife and scrape the bark up. Then make a tea and give him so it will heal up the poison from that knot in his side. Also, mix a few jimson weeds with it. So um, once the knot moved, and once the knot, whatever it was, was killed and it fell, now is, I, I guess how she's explaining it, that thing is, is no more not in his body, but it's still in his body. And it may possibly be uh, 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 turned into some type of poison that can still um, affect him. And so in order to deal with it, um, she told him to make a uh, one of a kind, uh, a hoodoo tea. Right. And we also have the ingredients to that as well. Um, if you like, you can write that down, screenshot, something like that. And uh, because I, I, I like to get the actual ingredients when I can, when I find our ancestors gave the ingredients so we can see uh, what exactly what were they using. Right. Instead of just saying it was a tea, what was in the tea? Right. That's always good to know. So um, we see that it was yellow peach tree leaves, yellow peach tree bark scraped off with a knife and jimson weeds. So that was mixed into a tea, and that tea was meant to be drunk by Albert to um, get rid of the poison that was left over from the killing of the knot that was in his body. So Ms. Hurst says, I come home and told him I wanted to give him a tea. He got scared and said, what fur, Ma? I, I tell... I had to tell him I was still carrying out the doctor's orders. Well, excuse me. He let me give him the tea and that boy got well. I went back to Miss Hirschpad and told her my son was well and I wanted to pay her. Go on, she said. Keep the dollar and send your children to school. This show happened to me and I know people can fix you. Yes, sir. The next story was told to Miss Heard by Miss Hirschpad, the woman who cured her son. Now, this is another interesting thing that lets you know Miss Hirschpad was the real deal and she was one of the kind. Now, I'm all for people should be paid for what they do. You know, uh, everybody has to make a living and living isn't free. But um, you, you know she wasn't a con artist and you know her conjure wasn't a con because... Um, she healed this woman's son, gave her information on how to heal her son. And when Miss Hurd came to pay Miss Hirschpad, Miss Hirschpad told her, you know, hey, man, you know what? Don't give me nothing. Keep your money and send your children to school. That is so honorable, right? That is so honorable. That's how you know it's not a con. It wasn't a con. It wasn't a scheme. It wasn't a game. She actually was one of the people that were born with the powers. Now, I'm going to do a video one day where I'm going to show you fake hoodoo practitioners. Like in our ancestors' time, I'm going to show you tales of fake conjurers because, you know, sometimes, you know, you got people that are fake anything, you know, just like you got some fake priests, fake pastors, fake imams, fake this, fake that. They, they, they pretend to be spiritual, but they're really not. You also had people who pretended to be conjure men and conjure women. And that's why some people didn't trust it. Some people didn't trust it because you had some people that abused it. But you did have people that were real. Some people who were actually born, they were actually born with the, these, these powers. Okay. Or, or they were actually trained by someone who knew what they were doing. So you do have the real and you do have the fake. And Miss Hirschpad, may your name live on forever. May your memory never die. She was one of the real ones. And you get a glimpse of that because, again, when Miss Heard tried to pay her, she told her, no, keep your money 
send your children to school. So she didn't even want the money. So this, obviously this was not a scam to uh, get money, right? Now, um, that that's a powerful story. I want to take a lot of time on that and really break that one down. Now, we have one more story that I'm going to go through with you guys today. And the next story is a story that Miss Hirschpath told Miss Heard about a uh, another conjure that she did, right? And this one, I uh, I you know jokingly called my eyes, my eyes. I'm going blind. So we dealt with a story about someone who had bugs in their head. We dealt with a story about an individual who had a knot in their side. And now we're finna deal with Miss Hirschpath healing somebody of blindness, someone that's going blind, and Miss Hirschpath heals them. So I call this one my eyes, my eyes. I'm going blind. Um, we're going to see conjured woman, Miss Hirschpath, tells a story of a young man who had been conjured and was going blind. And we're going to see what she did about that. This is a powerful, powerful story as well. OK, so um, look, check this out. I used to go see that woman quite a bit and even sent some of my friends to her. One day while I was there, she told me about this piece of work she did. So Miss Heard, after her son being healed and she knew that Miss Hirschpath was the real deal, she too began to refer some of her friends to go to her so that she could heal them as well. And she went and hung out with her quite often. And so one of these days when she's hanging out with Miss Hirschpath, no doubt drinking that illegal whiskey, <laughs> right? Drinking that illegal whiskey. She told her about um, some more work, some more hoodoo work that she did. So uh, look, there was a young man and his wife and they worked for some white folks. They had just married and was trying to save some money to buy a home with. All at once, the young man went blind and it almost ruined and it almost run him and his wife crazy because they didn't know what in the world to do. Well, somebody told him and her about Miss Hirschpad. So they went to see her. Another referral. One day, says Miss Hirschpad, a big fine carriage drew up in front of her door and the coachman helped him to her door. She asked him who sent them and he told her. Again, Miss Hirschpath doing the same thing. You knock on the door. You have to be referred by somebody and you're going to have to drink this whiskey. She only charged 50 cents for giving advice. And after you was cured, it was up to you to give her what you wanted to. Now, that's key. Anybody who knows current who do practitioners or people who do readings or people who do divination, a lot of times they don't have set prices on what they do. Right. They let you give them what you feel like their 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 work is worth. Right. And if you don't have it, they, they don't sweat that. OK, but this is it seems like it has been this for a long time in the hoodoo practitioner community. They don't have set prices. They let you basically like donate. You give them what you feel like their their work is worth. Um, I know people right now that they do readings. They're the same way. Um, um, so look, so she only charged 50 cents for giving advice. And after you was cured, it was up to you to give her what you wanted to. Well, this man gave her 50 cents and she talked to him. She says, boy, you go home and don't you put that cap on no more. What cap? He says that cap you wears to clean up the stables with. Because somebody done dress that cap for you. And every time you perspire and it run down to your eyes, it makes you blind. You just get that cap and bring it to me. I'll fix them. They're trying to make you blind, but eyes going to let you see. So we see that Miss Hirschpath is talking to this young man. Uh, hold on just a second. Lauren Mathis, we still have conjure healers around today. That's facts. That's facts, 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 Lauren, facts, Lauren Mathis. That's that that's true. The 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 practice is is not extinct. It it is it, is not terminated. It didn't wither away and disappear. 
there are still people who are carrying these practices of our ancestors. They, they, they have this passed down knowledge. They have this passed down information that they actually use to work, right? To, to, to perform work, to heal people, right? And like I say, you, know, you heal the natural and you heal the spiritual. It, 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 it all goes hands in hand. You heal someone's natural body, but you also have to heal someone's spiritual body. And our ancestors knew how to do that. And you're 100 percent correct. They still exist today. I actually had somebody uh, comment in one of my videos that I, I saw either yesterday or the day before. They commented on one of my videos and they said that they actually do root work. Uh, I don't personally know that individual, but I had an individual that popped up in my chat. They said that they do root work. And root work, conjure, hoodoo, it's all talking about the same thing. The conjuring, the root work doctors, they're, 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 that's all our ancestors' uh, spirituality, right? So definitely 100%, they, they still exist today. Um, now, check this out. Um, remember, Ms. Hirschpath uses divination. Right. She uses divination to look into the life of the individual that has come to her for healing. And um, she uses divination to figure out how they were conjured. And once she figures out how they were conjured, she can then break the conjure and perform a good conjure and make them whole again. So through means of divination, most likely using those same cards that she used. When she healed Mrs. Hurd's son, she realizes that someone has taken the cap of this young man, put a bad conjure on it, put bad juju on it. And so whenever he's wearing this cap and he begins to sweat, the sweat goes into his eyes to blind him. So she tells him, don't put the hat on anymore. Bring the hat to me. Remember, when people are trying to do bad juju on you or bad conjure on you, they try to get something personal of yours, right? Which in this case was his hat. But I've seen tales of an individual having a bad conjure on them and they use that individual's hair. They take pieces of that individual's hair and they'll make a mojo bag out of it and they'll use that to put the bad conjure on it. So someone got their hands on his hat and they put a bad conjure on it and this conjure was causing them to go blind. So when Ms. Hirschpath realizes that, she says, okay, look, check this out. Don't put the cap on anymore. Bring the cap to me. Remember, they like to, the conjurer likes to get their hands on the item that is that is causing the bad conjure so they can heal you and that they can fix you. Remember from the first story, um, there's a bug in my head. The conjure man wanted to get his hands on the bug that came out of Aunt Julian's ear so that he could he could fully break the conjure. But he couldn't get his hands on the bug. The bug escaped. And unfortunately, on Julian died. So you see this theme of figuring out what caused the conjure, getting your hands on that conjured item and then fixing it. You, you, you kind of see that these are some of the steps that, that, that takes place or that needs to take place. Right. Look, she says the boy was overjoyed and sure enough, he went back and brought her that cap. And it wasn't long for he could see good as you and me. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the details of what Miss Hirschpad did with the cap. Like we had the details of the um, poultice that she made and the tea that she made. But we know that um, she 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 performed some type of uh, ritual and ceremony with that cap to uh, heal him. So after he was healed from going blind, it says, he brought that woman $50, but she wouldn't take but $25 and give the other $25 back to him. Now, apparently this guy, whatever he's doing, he's well off um, because he, he's trying to buy a home. When he shows up to Miss Hirschpath house, he shows up in a, a big, fine carriage. He So he got money. He got a coachman drawing. He got money. So he comes and he tries to pay her $50. Remember, she didn't charge him nothing but 50 cents for the advice and said, whenever you get healed, bring me what you think is worth. So he tried to bring her $50, but she was like, no, nah, I'm not going to take the whole 50. I'm going to take 25 and I'm going to give you $25 back. That, again, shows you the integrity of Miss Hirschpad. And that lets you know that she's not a con artist. She's one of the real deal. 
There were fake conjurers out there, but not her. She is the real deal. It's not just about the money with her. It's about the craft. It's about the work. Because she could have been $50 richer, but she only kept $25. So shout out to the ancestor for being real. And look, she says, what I done told you is the truth. Every word of it. I know some other things that happened, but you come back another day for that. So Ms. Heard obviously has more tales of conjure, but we didn't hear them in those stories. So again, um, you know, we're allowing the ancestors to speak. And this has been three tales of hoodoo conjure, tarot cards, potions, supernatural sight, and more. Um, I, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed those three stories. I, heard, I hope you learned a lot more about hoodoo and conjuring. And most importantly, I hope it was interesting to you to hear the ancestors speak. Again, um, sometimes I think we go so far back into the ancient past to understand things about ourselves and we overlook the uh, 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 relevant history that is um, connected to our direct ancestors who endured um, slavery and who endured the Reconstruction era uh, immediately after slavery and the Jim Crow era. Um, I think if we look into that, we can find so many interesting tidbits of history and we can find out exactly how our ancestors uh, were able to survive. And um, what I like to do once again with this channel is I like to let the ancestors speak. I like to go to the slave narratives, aka our oral histories, and I like to break that down for you guys. I want this channel to be the premier channel that deals with our African-American, our Negro history right here on these shores um, as described and explained by our ancestors themselves. I want to show you what life was like for our ancestors based on their own words. And I, I believe that uh, hoodoo and the conjure man and the conjure woman don't get enough recognition for what they did to get our ancestors through um, the most trying time in history, uh, slavery. You know, we, we give credit to any and everything else, but I think more credit needs to be given to the conjure man and the conjure woman and the hoodoo practitioners. Without them, um, a lot of our people would not have survived and a lot of our people wouldn't have made it. Um, they even used hoodoo to escape. They even used hoodoo in slave rebellions and revolts. Um, and more that more of that needs to be uh, needs to be told. Um, now, before I get out of here, I just want to show you one more time the references. If anybody wants to look into some of this themselves, this came out of the Georgia slave narratives, um, what I like to call the oral histories. And um, it is the story of ancestor Emmeline Hurd. So if you look up Emmeline Hurd in Georgia slave narratives, um, you can go directly to the primary source. And you can read through this for yourself, right? You can read through this for yourself and you can get a lot of this information. So as always, I hope you guys heard something that you never heard before. If you heard something that you have heard before, I hope that I was able to give you guys more information about it. Thank you for everybody that tapped in. Thank you for everybody that watching. Thank you for everybody that watched. Thank you for everybody that liked. Thank you for everybody that subscribed. Um, Ian Williams. Uh, oh, I see, I see you still in the building. Thanks for riding it out with me. Um, and William says, I enjoyed the knowledge. I appreciate you. Thank you. And I, I appreciate you too. You know, it's all about um, reciprocity. Reciprocity is a, is, is a big thing. Um, the same way you appreciate me taking the time to do this, I appreciate you taking the time to watch and uh, respond. That's ultimately my, my reward for the time I put in researching this stuff, reading this stuff, putting together these presentations and doing the historical background so that I can fill in some of the blanks to show you where these people live, show you where they were enslaved is, show you what they meant by this, what they meant by that. Um, all, all, all of that is very important. All of that is very important. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, probably going to be doing another video in a couple of days. I got a lot more interesting stuff I want to show, um, a lot more interesting stuff I want to teach. Uh, you know, so, uh, and like I said, oh yeah, if you, if you want to support, uh, real quick, I'm going to show you guys something. Um, I like to call myself the real bookworm, right? And I like to call myself the real bookworm for a reason. 
I'm actually a, uh, a published author. I have uh, 16 books out right now, right? I have 16 books out right now. And um, if you want to support, if you want to support the channel, you know, keep this thing going. Um, you can always do so by purchasing one of my books. Uh, yeah, you can always donate. Donation is good. And I appreciate everybody that has donated. But you can also purchase one of my books. Um, if you're into urban fiction novels at all, uh, some people are into urban fiction novels. Um, I'm going to show you guys one of my books real quick. That's how I have 16. Uh, real quick. Okay, bam. Look, you can go to Amazon.com, type in Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels. I want you to type in Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels. I want you to read the synopsis. Check out this book. And if you're interested, go ahead on and purchase it. You can also get a uh, signed copy directly from me. Um, uh, like You can cash at me and email me the address. I'll mail it out to you guys. If you're interested in that, just leave me a comment. Let me know. And I can give you the steps to get a signed copy directly from me. But uh, what Suicide Note is about, um, it's about a young man, 15, um, come from a single parent home. His mother is on drugs and he has his young sister that he's trying to take care of as well. Um, young AB, the main character, he's trying to hustle his way out of the streets. He believes that he can make enough money to where he can hustle himself out of the streets. Now, while trying to hustle his way out of the streets, he gets himself into trouble with some of the local gangs in the area. And it turns into a revenge mission where he's trying to revenge his best friend by committing murders and robberies. And um, he's just in that fast paced uh, uh, route to try to get out of the street. I'll read the synopsis for you guys real quick before I get out of here. Quick commercial break. Growing up on the rough streets of Dickinson, Texas, in one of the worst neighborhoods in the city, a young man by the name of A.B. is doing everything in his power to make it out of his criminal lifestyle before it kills him. Never really knowing his father and having a drug addicted, addicted mother, A.B. and his younger sister have lived in poverty all of their lives. At a young age, A.B. vows to change all of that and he's willing to do any and everything to achieve his goals. Even if that means he must sell drugs to his community, rob anyone with a dollar, and also murder anyone who gets in his way. In his attempts to get rich and legit, A.B. runs into a street smart, older white woman named Layla, who appears to be everything he wanted and more. With Layla's help, the two of them come up with a scheme to end all schemes. The pair goes on a crime spree in Galveston County that leaves enemies dead, police officers baffled, gangs members wanting their heads on a platter, and their roller coaster. Bonnie and Clyde type romance even leaves A.B. suspicious of Layla's real intentions. Does she really love him? Does she really want to see him succeed? Will the two of them ride off into the sunset with enough cold, hard cash to live a lavish lifestyle and never look back? Or will this whirlwind romance, criminal slash criminal enterprise, usher young A.B. into an early grave? You have to read his suicide note to find out. I guarantee you, if you read that, you'll be glad that you did. So thanks for watching Matthew Daniels TV. I'm your host, the writer, author, scribe, and bookworm. But I'm not just a bookworm world. I am the real bookworm. Make sure you get it right. I'm doing the book game like it ain't never been done before. And I'm doing the book game like it'll probably never be done again. And as always, family, may your name live on forever. And may your memory never die. Hotel, I'm out.